Einstein Campbell. And Nicole is a Northwestern graduate. Um, she has been so gracious that she and her husband were here for uh, the Northwestern Alumni Banquet where she was recognized as our first alumni for the Outstanding Art Emphasis. Is that the title? Something like that. Something like that. And uh, could have chosen anybody better uh, to be the first one to ever receive this award. Nicole uh, has a lot to share with you, but I'm going to let her tell her story, kind of like Grant told his, of what did I do when I left here, okay, and what do you do now? So, um, yeah, I've graduated, what now? <coughs> and uh, take really good notes, because some of you need this next week. Lisa, <laughs> Tyler, Aaron, some of you guys need this info next week. All right. Thank you, Nicole. You're welcome. How's everybody doing? Good. 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 Yeah. You guys, some of you are getting close to graduating, right? Yeah. Excited? One? Two. Two? Two. Are you guys excited? Yep. I'm all scared? Yep. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> I was right where you were many years ago. Um, I graduated in 1993. And after I graduated, I moved to Atlanta. Um, because in Oklahoma, unfortunately, there's not a lot of, there's not a lot, any, anything in this industry really that you can do here. So that's one of the things is you have to move to where the work is in the field that you want to be in. And we're going to talk a little bit about that today. So I moved to Atlanta. Atlanta is a really good regional market for the entertainment field. Um, especially back in the early 90s, in the heat of the night, was still filming there. I don't know if any of you have ever seen or heard of that television show, but it was um, very big back then. And um, they had several other shows that were filmed there, and Atlanta was a hot spot for a lot of movies and films to come through. So I moved there and um, decided I was going to act. So um, consequently, I got a job as a bartender and waitress. <laughs> and I uh, did that for a while while pursuing my acting career. Got an agent and started auditioning. And I was on In the Heat of the Night. Um, I did several commercials, um, lots of independent film, um, theater work there as well, although Atlanta's not a big theater mecca. But they do have a, a really good regional theater there, the Alliance Theater and also. Um, after that, um, it was going fairly well, I was enjoying myself, and, and I was getting um, quite a few things. Um, I decided I wanted to open a children's theater, so we, I did that for a while and traveled around to the Atlanta metro area schools and, and did children's theater at the elementary schools there. And then I took a, a job as a, a national training director for a national acting school, and then from there moved to opening my own studio, which is what I do now in Atlanta. And it's called the Actor Scene, and we focus on training people who want to get into the field for television and film. That is our focus, television and film, and then placing them with agents, not only on a local and regional level, but also on a national level through New York and Los Angeles. Um, we've been open seven years, and in that time, we've had over 100 students who have come through our studio who have been in major roles in film, on Broadway, in television, print, TV commercials, and the music industry. So we focus on, on really helping guide those people who want to be in this as a performer to get to that next level. Um, we've had students who have been on Vampire Diaries, Grey's Anatomy, Hannah Montana, um, we have a student who is starring, playing Owen Wilson's daughter in the upcoming movie Hall Pass, which is filming in Atlanta right now. Um, we have a student who got a lead role in a new CBS pilot, um, medical drama from the same producer who's done ER and West Wing. Um, we've had people star in uh, We Are Marshall. I mean, I could, I could go on. You can go to our website and see a list of, of all of our working actors on our website, which is theactorsing.com. Um, and probably the biggest success that I've worked with in the past 15 years 
is a boy by the name of Lucas Till. He came to me when I was at, um, before I opened my studio, and I took him under my wing and, and groomed him, got him his first agent, and just recently he starred with Miley Cyrus as her love interest in the Anna Montana movie. His name is Lucas Till. Um, and so he's having a big breakout career right now. Um, so that's just a little bit about me and my background and, and my credentials. Um, I've worked really long and hard on really establishing my network of contacts. And in this industry, in order to be successful, you really have to concentrate on that. The old saying, it's not what you know, but who you know. There's some truth in that. You can have all the knowledge in the world, but if you don't have the contacts to help you succeed, you're not going to get anywhere with it. So you really have to understand that, and you have to really network yourself. Okay, so you guys, some of you are graduating in a couple months or in a month. Some of you maybe next year or the year after. But one of the big, biggest challenges for me when I graduated is what do I do now? How do I take what I've learned at Northwestern and translate that into a career? And I had to do a, a lot of it through trial and error because a lot of the things that you learn here is really great, but it doesn't really prepare you as much for what happens in the real life and the step-by-step -step process that you have to do once you get out there and you start meeting with people and, and, and you start trying to, to take yourself places. So I had to learn all of that through trial and error. So I'm going to share a lot of that with you today to kind of help you, give you shortcuts. So if you listen and um, you're smart, you will take this advice and you will go with it. And you won't have to spend the years that it took me to go through this with a trial and error kind of process. So you've graduated. What now? You have... In this industry, just like any other industry that you, you want to be in, there are factors of success that you have to have in order to be successful. The first one is attitude. This is huge in this industry. I cannot tell you how important your attitude is in taking you far in this industry. This industry, unfortunately, has a lot of people who have big egos, who maybe shouldn't necessarily have big egos. And agents, managers, directors, casting directors don't like to work with people who have attitudes. And one thing that you have to remember is this field is very, very competitive. These people have thousands of people to choose from. And so if they're slightest little thing about you that they don't like, they're just going to go on to the next person. And, and that next person will be willing to have the attitude that these people want to work with. You have to remember that when you get hired for a job as an actor, you are working with a lot of different people who depend on you. You're working with all of the lighting crew, you're working with the set crew, you're working with the director, you're working with the grips, you're working with the cameraman, you're working with the DP. And on a movie, for example, you could be there for weeks upon weeks. They want to have people around them who are enjoyable to work with, who are flexible. I talk to them, um, my students all the time about flexibility. You have to be flexible in this industry, and that's a big part of attitude. A lot of people want to go on set, and you'll have a certain call time, and you'll be there, and you'll go into hair and makeup, and then you'll sit for hours because they aren't ready for you because something else has gone on or they're trying to fix the lighting, there's all this technical equipment, and they may not get to you for hours. And a lot of people complain about that. And they say, well, you know, I was supposed to be here at 8 o'clock, and it's now 12, and they haven't even used me yet. Guess what? Too bad. That's your job as a 
And then you hear about people who have great attitudes and great work ethics, like Tom Hanks, who's considered one of the nicest guys in Hollywood, who, who has great work ethic and has a wonderful attitude on set, and he's very helpful and he'll do anything. And he has, you know, he's one of the top 10 A-list actors in Hollywood. So your attitude can sometimes take you farther than anything else. So that's a big thing to remember. Your next thing is your personality. This has a lot to do also with your attitude. So when you go in for an audition and you get a call back, let's say, and so it's down between you and two other people for the part. And you go in and you meet with the producers um, or you go to network. At that point, everybody was talented. Everybody could play the role. What's gonna make you stand out over the other two people? What's gonna win you the job? It's gonna be your personality. Can you interview well? Can you walk into a room and can you own it? Can you talk to the people and make them feel at ease? And that's a gift that you have to learn. Um, how, when you walk in the room, you want to make the people who are interviewing you feel good. You want to put them at ease. Because sometimes they're nervous. Sometimes they are so wanting that person to walk in the room and they want it to be you. And you have to make them feel like they're your best friend. And you have to be in person, an engaging person, somebody that is exciting to talk to. And, you, and that all happens through the audition process. It's not just auditioning with your, your acting skills and your talent. It's your personality, too. And a lot of times your personality can win you jobs over other people because you may be just a much more fun and engaging person than the other people at the call back. Perseverance. that you 
shows are currently on top right now in the Nielsen ratings. You all should know what movies are the hit blockbusters. You all should know what movies are coming out for the next two years. You all should know what different networks put on different types of television shows because every network has their own type of packing style. Every show has a different type of packing style. And when you go in and you audition for these shows, you have to know what type of acting style you're auditioning for so you can do that. Because if you go in and you audition for, let's say, a Nickelodeon show who has a very specific acting style and you do it um, like uh, One Tree Hill on CW, you're not going to get the part because you don't fit what they're selling. So you have to understand that you have to, to come at it at a, at a, as a business on breaking into the business. Look back, um, Google that city. And you guys have something that I didn't have back in 1993, and that's the internet. There is a wealth of information. You can Google anything and find out anything about anything these days. So I would really research that market, find out what agents are there, find out if it's a hot spot for movies and films, find out if are coming to film there. And those, that's all information that you can find out right online. Next, you need to find some good training classes and workshops. If you're going to be an actor in this industry, you're always, always, always going to be taking classes. You're always going to be training. You're never story about um, David Dunn, who uh, was a casting director at Nickelodeon at the time. He was giving a seminar, and he was talking about this point, and he said that he, there was a, a person that he was interested in, and he was interviewing them, and, and he asked them, you know, what kind of classes are you taking? And um, the person said, oh, well, I already took that you're competing against people and you have to stay competitive in your skills. You have to stay competitive against every single other person out there who's auditioning. And some of those people have been training for years and years and years. Some of them have tons of credits on their resume from when they were starting when they were babies on up. And you're competing against those very same people to learn the role. And <clears throat> so you always have to be in training. There's lots of different kinds of classes you can take and we're going to go over that. for an agent. You have to have an agent. 
today's student film directors are tomorrow's directors. Today's assistants are tomorrow's decision makers. Always, always, always be nice to everybody you meet. Never burn any bridges. And always network. Network, network, network. All right, so where should you go? Different areas of the country um, are hot spots in the American film field. Of course, we have the two big ones, Los Angeles and New York City. Those are where most things are filmed and where most things are cast. Los Angeles is geared more towards television and film. New York City has film and television, but it also has theater or Broadway. If your interest is in the area of theater, you need to go to New York, New York City. There's really no other place for you because in every other area, there's not much paid theater. So if you actually want to make a living and earn money doing theater, New York City is where you have to go. Even in Atlanta, there's only one theater in Atlanta that even pays, and it's not very much. It's not enough to live on. So an agent outside of New York City, they don't really submit for, for theater at all because an agent doesn't get paid unless their talent gets the job. So Los Angeles and New York City are your two major markets. <coughs> Atlanta. Atlanta is a great regional market. Um, a lot of movies are filmed there. There's a lot of big businesses that are based there. So there's a lot of commercials that are filmed there. A lot of industrials, which are corporate video. A lot of radio. A lot of voiceover work, a lot of print, so it's a really good regional market. Furthermore, there are other smaller markets around Atlanta that have a lot of work. You have a lot of work in the Carolinas, you have a lot of work in Tennessee, you have a lot of work in Louisiana, you have a lot of work in Florida, all of which if you are based in Atlanta is a short drive that you can get to to audition or film throughout that region. So Atlanta is a, a, a really good area. Furthermore, a couple years ago, they just passed new tax incentive laws for production companies to come in there and film, which means they're giving tax breaks to the movie studios, the TV studios that come there to film to create jobs and, and help the economy. So Atlanta has really, really grown over the last couple of years and all of the number of movies and different productions that have come there. Plus, we have Tyler Perry Studios that are based there. Tyler Perry has built a huge studio um, in the Atlanta area, and all of his TV shows are filmed there. And um, he rents out his back lots. There's a big place for movie studios to look at dailies and, and all kinds of things that didn't exist um, six years ago. So that's another draw. Um, Atlanta also has the coast, or not Atlanta, Georgia also has the coast, it has mountains, and it has big city, which all make it very inviting because of different locations that people can film um, to get different scenery and, and, and so forth. So Atlanta's a really good market. Um, Chicago. Chicago's another really big market. Uh, a lot of things are, are filmed out of Chicago. Um, it's, a, it's an okay market for theater, too. A lot of theater people will start out Miami is huge, um, especially for fashion. A lot of fashion and a lot of um, magazine shoots go on there. Um, but it also does a lot of television and, and kind of things there as well. And then Dallas. Dallas is probably the closest thing to you all, so if you didn't want to venture too far from home. Dallas is a good regional market. Um, they have some shows that are filmed there, and um, so it's good to, to go there and get
audition by Michael Sherla. He is considered one of the founding fathers and creators of American theater, and he has some really good step-by-step um, -step audition processes that you can do as an actor. How to Become a Successful Commercial Model. These are vital to any actor, director, I don't care what field of the entertainment industry you're going to go into, you should get subscriptions to trade publications. They tell you everything that's going on in your business. Those are Variety, Hollywood Porter, Reporter, and Backstage West. They tell you what films are coming up. They tell you who's been cast and what. They tell you what films are in production. What, who, what is in post-production, what's in pre-production. Um, they tell you who the big agents are right now. You, you, this is how people will stay abreast of what's going on in the entertainment industry by reading these trade publications. Google acting sites in your area. Read blogs, chat with other actors in the area. Other actors can give you a wealth of information. Although you have to be careful about what information you take from other actors because um, some of them may guide you in the wrong direction on purpose because they see you as competition. So you have to use your common sense about that. And training. But I have a college degree. Why do I need more training? I hear that all the time. Because actors train. Because you can always be better at your craft. Professional sports players train every single day, even though they have made it professional. You as actors should be training all the time to get better at your craft. Some different aspects of training. Film training, audition training, cold read training improv training, TV commercial training. Just those things alone are all skills that you have to have in order to go on an audition. You have to stay competitive. Like I said, there are thousands upon thousands of people who audition, who want to be in this industry, and you have to stay competitive. you find good classes? One way is where you, when you decide where you want to live, call the SAG office, which is the Screen Actors Guild, to see if they have a list of recommended places for you to take acting. Call area agents or managers and see if they will give you a list of people that they recommend to their town. Google acting classes or studios in your area. When you do that, always ask if you can audit a class before you take it. That means you can go in and sit in on a class for free and see what kinds of things that they are teaching. That will give you a good feel of whether the class is going to be a right fit for you. There's all different kinds of classes out there, and there are all different kinds of techniques that are taught. And I get asked the question a lot, well, which acting technique do you which acting technique do you recommend? And I say, I don't recommend one over the other. You need to know all the different techniques and what you do as an actor is you take bits and pieces from all the different acting techniques and you kind of create your own. Because not everything works for every person. And you have to find within yourself what's going to help you make yourself the most believable are in an acting role. So there's no one right or wrong acting method. You can study Meisner, you can study Stanislavski, you can study Descent to Memory, you can study all of that.
not everything's going to work for everybody. And all of those things, different elements of all of those techniques work for different people. At our studio in Atlanta, I don't teach just one thing. I take different acting exercises and kind of create our own syllabus um, designed to make that light bulb moment go off different people, because different people think different ways, different people relate to things in different ways, and so not everybody learns the same. Talk to other actors, see what classes they've taken in the area, what they, what they like about it, ask them specifically, what did you learn, why did you take it, what, did you, what benefit did you get out of it, be specific. Build your contact list at the same time that you're getting training is to take classes from casting directors if you can find them in the area um, that offer classes. Casting directors are really good people to learn from because they are running the casting sessions every day. It's what they do for a living. So they're going to give you specific pointers on auditioning that you may not find or discover anywhere else that can help you when you go in for an audition. They also have the power. They're the ones who tell the agents who they want to see when, when a, a breakdown comes out. So getting to know these people and if they like you is a, an amazing way to advance your career. So anytime you find a class that's being taught by a casting director, you should take that class. Finding an agent. one of the hardest things that people encounter when they try to get into the business. It was the hardest thing for me when I moved to Atlanta. It took me um, over a year just to find an agent. And, um, you know, I had a, a pretty good resume coming out of here and going into the business. I had a college degree. And I, at first I didn't understand why I couldn't just call an agent's office and say, you know, give me an interview. Let me come audition for you. It doesn't work that way. You know what they tell you? Submit a picture. Don't call us. We'll call you if we're interested. That's what they tell you. As an actor, how are you supposed to show your acting skills with a picture? So what I ended up having to do was take a class from somebody that I knew who knew an agent. And that's how I got my foot in the door. So again, building up those contacts, building up those networks. You want to call your um, SAG office to find a list of reputable agents. There are a lot of agencies out there who say that they're agencies, but that's really not the focus of their business. So you want to make sure that you find the reputable one um, that is either a member of SAG or office and they say, oh, you're great, we want to represent you, but you need to take one of our classes. That's an immediate red flag you should run. Because it's a conflict of interest for an agency to offer training classes because then that becomes the focus on how that agency makes money, not by booking their actors' work. So you don't want to sign up with an agency who is requiring you to now, all agencies, if they're good, are going to recommend that you take classes. And what, what they should do is hand you a list of several different acting coaches in the area or acting studios that you can go to to take classes. But you don't ever take it from them. <laughs> um, you can submit your headshot and resume either by email or snail mail. You should do that every three months because if an agent doesn't want you now, you never know how their needs are going to change three months from now. So you want to submit every three months until you get an agent. Every three months. Every three months. Every three months. Put your face in front of them as much as you can. Perform in showcases where 
agents and managers will be in attendance. Even if you have to pay to be in that showcase, if you know that reputable agents or managers are going to be there, this is a smart way to spend your money. Because as an actor, you want to be able to show them what you can do. And a showcase is a perfect way. Here's what a lot of my smart students do. They offer to intern in an agent's office one to two days a week for free. For free. It doesn't have to be all day. It can be a couple hours. Anybody tell me why that would be smart? They get to know you. They get to know you. They get to like you as a person. They get to, they get to, to see your personality. And once that happens, you've established a personal relationship with them. And they're more likely to offer you a presentation at that point. So it's very smart. was a model before um, she moved into the other side. And after her modeling career, because modeling careers are very short-lived, um, she decided she wanted to go into the other end of the industry and she wanted to be a casting director and she wanted to be a manager. So she walked into Beverly Long Casting in Los Angeles and Beverly Long was a very famous actress, detective with um, <laughs> walked into the casting office and she just said, I want to be a casting director. I want to learn from you, but I'm going to work for you for free. I will do your dishes. I will take out your trash. I will do anything and everything. Just let me be around here. Just let me be in the office. And so Beverly was impressed with that and uh, let her. And so today she is Beverly partner and is kind of taking over in the casting because Beverly is now very famous and has semi-retired. So you have to be smart about these things. These are all different ways that you can kind of, you have to create your own ways of getting your foot in the door. in the industry, you, you never, I kind of talked about this earlier, you never know who can help you. Again, um, people who are secretaries today, people who check in, people at, at casting offices when you go in for an audition, um, people's personal assistants, um, the makeup artist, the photographer you work with, all of those people have influence in the industry, probably more than you think. And if you are friends with them, if you make friends with them, you will be doing yourself a huge favor and helping your career move to the next step. So always, always remember that. Don't ever have an attitude with people, ever. I don't care if they make a mistake. Be gracious, be kind, be forgiving, say it's okay. Um, always, always, always make sure you are nice to every single question a lot. What does an agent do? What is an agent's job? An agent can represent anywhere from a hundred to a thousand people, depending on how big the agency is. Remember, they are representing all different ages, sexes, um, ethnicities, so they can have a wide, they, which they call a board, they can have a lot of talent on their board representing all those different typecasts. An agent gets you auditions. The way the process works is breakdowns come from the casting directors to the agents, and the agent looks at the breakdown and sees what type of role, and they submit people who fit that role to the casting directors. The casting
casting directors will then pick people that they're interested in from the agent submissions. So the agent is the one who submits you for auditions. The agent can negotiate your rates, especially when you're starting out. Once you become a big star, you usually have a lawyer that does all that for you. You have to fill in. The agent doesn't. An agent is a one-year contract usually with a clause in there that says that they can free up that, that one year to the next year, unless you as the talent say no. They can take, they take 10 to 20% commission. If it's a SAG job, meaning if it's a Screen Actors Guild job, or a union job, they take 10%, that's the law. If it's a non-union job, they can take up to 20%. This is the only way that an agent is supposed to make money, is taking commissions. They do not charge you a fee. They do not charge you to represent them. They do not ask you for money. They make money when you get the job. Okay? However, you must provide the agent with marketing material in order for them to do their job effectively and that will cost you some startup money and we're willing to that too. What does an agent not do? This is um, a big misconception in the industry. Can anybody guess what an agent does not do? Doesn't get you the job. Doesn't get you, does not get you work, okay? That is not an agent's job to get you work. Whose job is that? to pay for an agent. You will have startup costs. You will have photo shoots. You have to pay for those. The agent does not pay for those for you. So if out of your photo shoots, you may be required to have headshots or comp cards. You have to get those printed. That does cost. Now, a typical photo shoot. Now, and here's where a lot of people are taken in for big bucks, so you, you want to have this. This is good where you have this knowledge. In New York, LA, Atlanta, most of your major markets, a good photo shoot costs anywhere from $150 to $375, and that includes the makeup artist. If you are paying more than $375 for your photo shoot, you better look twice at that because that's probably not the best person to go to because that's probably more of a money making. Another big, that's another big red flag. If the agent says you have to use our in-house photographer, run. Because that is a way that agents make money. And an agent, remember, the only way an agent is supposed to make money is by their talent booking work. What if they suggest someone that they don't If they suggest somebody, that's okay, but it should be more than one person. They should have a list of several different photographers they suggest that you go to. That's typically how it works in the industry. Website fees. Website fees are big right now. Um, most agencies have all of their talent on the website these days instead of submitting um, hard copy headshots. Um, and they do not pay. The talent has to pay like a yearly fee of anywhere from 50 to 100 dollars a year to put their their picture on the website and that's a legitimate fee. Some agents will have a mailing or FedEx fee, um, small fee that you pay up front for the year and that's okay too, especially smaller agencies. It is not okay to pay them a fee to sign up. They manage all aspects of your career, from 
finding you an agent, from guiding you to which classes may be best for you, for helping you prepare for an audition, telling you what you should wear for your auditions. They are your day-to-day -day contacts, the people that you go to when you have questions about anything. They are there for you specifically on a one-on-one -on -one basis. You can't call your agent every day and ask them all of these little questions. They are too busy. They're representing a thousand people and they're on the phone all day calling all of their talent, telling them where their auditions are and, and trying to, to get everybody sent out on auditions. If they had even a hundred of their people calling them every day to ask them questions, they wouldn't be able to get any of their talent out on auditions. Okay? So you don't call your agent every day. That's what a manager is for. They advise you on training. They make sure that you are not lost at any agency. This is a big one. A lot of people ask me, does it really pay to have a manager? Because you're paying your manager commission when you book work and you're paying your agent a commission. So you could be paying out anywhere from 25 to 35% off the top to your agent and manager. Um, this is one of the main things that a manager does, is they make sure you're not lost in an agency. An agency is representing a thousand people. How do they remember you? A lot of times agents only have finite number of slots that they can submit people to for an audition with a casting director. So if they have five people in one typecast, but they only can submit three people, they're going to pick their top three. Your manager is going to make sure that you are always the first on the list to be submitted for any project. So you know you're getting out. You're, at least you're being submitted for everything out there that you're writing for. Whether you get called for an audition or not, that's another story. But at least you're being submitted for everything. Your manager builds that relationship with the agent for you. You never have to be the bad guy. You have, let's say you have um, an agent and you get a TV commercial audition and you get a film audition at the same time and you know you can't be two places at once. If you didn't have a manager, you yourself would have to try and call both agents and coordinate that. Um, and then it's a real pain for the, the agents and then they can look at you as being kind of a pain. Your manager takes care of all of that for you. manager represents anywhere from 1 to 40 people, so they manage a lot less, so they can be more personal with you. A manager's contract is anywhere from 3 to 5 years. This is because they spend a lot of time up front developing you. They kind of look at it as your college career. It takes time for you to build up your career, and just at the point where you're booking, they don't want you to say, okay, I've learned everything, goodbye. You know, they are putting in a lot of time and, and energy up front to develop you for a payoff later. And they usually take anywhere from 10 to 20% commission. 15 is usually the norm. work as a team with your agent to get you on, to um, make sure you're being submitted for the audition, but they're not responsible for getting you the audition. Casting director responsibility. Casting directors do not represent talent. They are the ones who pick people for the audition. Casting directors cast the roles. I'm asking you guys. No, we're like. <laughs> yes, or, yes or no? No. No. Who casts the roles? The director or the producer? The casting director, though, does have a lot of power in that they pick the people who actually get seen. They run the casting session and decide who goes on tape for the director or producer. Um, a lot of times when you go in for an initial audition, it's just going to be the casting director in there, and they're going to put you on tape. If you're really bad, guess what? You don't make the tape. It gets erased. Okay? Because they're not going to put anybody on the tape for the director to see or the producer to see who is not very good. So not only do they get to decide who actually gets to the 
audition, they decide who the director or the producer sees. They are paid by the ad agency or the producer or the movie studio or the TV network. They are not paid by you. They don't get commissions or anything like that. <coughs> Other important people. What's a network? financier of product. So who do you think has the ultimate decision about anything that goes on in the project? Because they're the ones paying the bills. Movie studios. What are some major movie studios? Paramount. Paramount. WB. WB. Disney. Disney. MGM. Okay. So how the system works. Many agents are exclusive by category, especially in Los Angeles, meaning you can only be with one agent per category. Um, so you could have a TV commercial agent, and you could have a theatrical agent, and you could have a print agent. They can all be different people within the same company or with different companies, but you can't have two TV commercials can't have two theatrical agents um, because if you were, if you had, let's say you had two TV commercial agents and both of them submitted you for a TV commercial, you go in and audition and you get the part. Which agency gets paid? Do you want to pay double commission? No. So you can only have one. Some agencies may want you across the board, meaning they want you for all the different categories that they have in their agency. Or they just might want you for a certain category. In your big agencies in New York and Los Angeles, you have different people running different departments. You have somebody who runs a TV commercial. You have somebody who runs voiceover. You have somebody who runs print. You have somebody who runs um, the theatrical department. And so all of those different agents have to like you want you in order for you to be across the board with that agency. Some people start out and they only have TV commercial agents at first until they build up their resume. That's okay. In Los Angeles, they have something called the breakdown services. Does anybody know what that is? Breakdown services is a service every single agent subscribes to. The casting directors put on the breakdown services everything that they're casting for for that day or for the next week or so on and so forth. And the agents pull that up online and they see, okay, what's, what's being cast today or tomorrow or next week? And they submit their talent for each role on the breakdown services through breakdown casting director will then go into breakdowns and they will see all of the headshots or all of the pictures of the agents across the city, meaning all of the agents in LA, every single one of them, there's over 300 agents in Los Angeles, have submitted all hundreds of thousands and thousands of people for each specific role. And they look through all those pictures and they pick who they want to see from That's what breakdown services are. You cannot get breakdown services legally if you're not a licensed agent or talent manager. Okay, so you cannot submit yourself, in other words. Um, LA Casting is, is the same type of service, only it's for TV commercials. So breakdowns is for mainly for TV shows movies, LA casting is for TV commercials. That's how
how we do it in Los Angeles. New York is a little bit different style. They don't have breakdown services set up there. It's, it's more old school. Network is more who's friends with who. Um, have a, a TV commercial casting director friend who comes in every six months to the studio. And he tells me that he has his list of five, his five favorite agents. So when he gets booked a job to cast, he'll call and he rotates who he calls first. So he'll call agent number one and he'll say, okay, I, I have a Coke commercial I'm casting for and I need a um, African-American 20 to 25 year old six foot tall person, who do you have? So while he's explaining this, the person who answers the phone or the agent will yell out to the office to all the bookers that are in there, the specifics, and they all get on the phone and start calling all of their talent who fit that category to try to get them in to see Barry first. And because in New York, actors freelance and they are signed with more than one agency. So it's whoever calls them first gets the, the commission if they were to book the job. And so then Barry goes down to agent number two. And so then that agent starts the process. And so they all try to be the first person to call their best actors first for the role. So it's crazy in New York. It's crazy. Um, but that's how this, the system works in New York. So you can freelance in New York and you can be with more than one agent per category. And they try to try and want you to sign exclusive if they really like you. But it's really not in the actor's best interest to do that. Because not everybody gets called for everything. <coughs> send him people um, that he doesn't like or he still needs people, then he'll start going down and calling other agencies after that. So he has his five favorites. So everybody has their own little clicks in New York. Um, in the Southeast, they have what's called 800 casting. And that's kind of like breakdown services, only for the Southeast. So a lot of the agents subscribe to that and will get all the projects off of 800 casting. Okay. Who knows anything about SAG and AFTRA? Hmm. What do they do? Anybody? Anybody know what the Screen Actors Guild does? What's its main purpose? for a union job, you know for a specific part that you are going to be paid at least so much for that role. And they cannot pay you less. After, does anybody know what AFTRA stands for? Anybody? American Federation for Television and Radio Arts. SAG is for anything that's on <coughs> film. AFTRA is for anything that's on digital. So SAG governs anything that is made on film. And AFTRA governs the laws and pay scales and all that for anything that's shot digitally. Nowadays, more and more things are switching over to digital. So AFTRA is gaining more power. to either of the two major markets, New York or Los Angeles, that you know everything and everything about SAG and AFTRA. You cannot be a working actor, a successful one, without being a member of SAG or AFTRA. It is very hard to be a member of SAG, which is the main one you want to concentrate on right now going to New York or LA. As an adult, a lot of It's hard to 
become a member of SAG because you can't join SAG unless you have done a SAG project. And you can't, in a rural state, you can't really do a SAG project unless you are a member of SAG. So it's a catch-22. So how do you do it? What has to happen is anytime somebody wants to hire somebody who's not union to do a union job, they have to pay a fee to the union in order to do so. And then you become SAG eligible. And if you are in one of the major markets, you have so many days of So they have to like you so much that they're willing to pay extra money to have you. How often is that going to happen? Okay. So that's one of your challenges in, in being in this industry. It's much easier for a child to be in this industry because so many children aren't members of the union, and so it's a regular thing in order for them to, to pay that fee for a child than it is for adults. There are different ways you can become, become a member of SAG. Besides just getting a role, you can, any, anytime you have a, um, a speaking line that bumps you up to being SAG eligible, um, you can go to a right to work state like Georgia um, in the Atlanta market and you can do union and non union jobs there without having to be members of the union. So that's how a lot of adult actors start out when they, they go there and they get union jobs and become what's called SAG eligible. So then when they move to a major market, they but New York and LA don't work that way. So it's, it's, it makes it hard for an adult actor. Um, a lot of times if you're doing extra work, um, we recommend a lot of our adult actors to start out doing extra work because a lot of times you can get bumped up to a featured extra or you can get bumped up to an under five, um, which makes you SAG eligible and then you can join the union that way. But it takes money to join the union. I think the union dues are up to fifteen or sixteen modeling in New York. Modeling is exclusive. It's not freelance for agents. Okay, so what happens if you don't get an agent or you don't have an agent right away? You want to keep submitting. Agents need to change. They may not have room for your typecast the first time you submit or the second time you submit, but three months down the line, they may their needs may have changed and they, need, they, may, they may need somebody like you. Look for open calls at agencies. Sometimes, especially in your smaller markets, very rarely in your bigger markets, but sometimes in your smaller, smaller markets, like Atlanta or Dallas or Miami, they'll have open calls at the agencies where they set up a time and a day where they will take people to go in and audition for them off the street. Build your resume. shot went along with your resume to production companies and ad agencies in your area. A lot of times production companies need new actors or fresh faces for small projects for mom and pop businesses who don't have big budgets but still are doing a TV commercial or a corporate video and they have a file for those people in the production companies have a file of actors people who are willing to work for next to nothing or for free. So this is 
one way you can build your resume by sending out your headshot and telling these production companies, hey, I'm trying to build my resume, I will work for free, or next to nothing, please use me if something comes up. Same thing with ad agencies for, for print. Interning. casting.com if you are in the southeast you would need to join that that's like a $20 fee a year um, because that's how all of the agents submit you you can also um, find out about projects through 800 casting <clears throat> actorsaccess.com that's another site where you can submit yourself and you can find out all of the different projects that are being casted throughout the country and they break it up by region
Those are an actor's business card. Resume. I have emailed Kimberly a template of a basic acting resume. Um, so you can get that from her and you just follow the outline. A lot of actors have personal websites nowadays to help promote themselves. They put um, their work on there. Um, they, they'll upload video from the different commercials or independent films or anything that they do. They'll upload that to their website. And um, so that's how a lot of actors will promote themselves. Some actors get little business cards with their pictures printed on. So if they're out and they don't want to carry their big headshots, they can hand out a little business card. Many actors who have work have what's called an actor's reel. This is like a one to two minute video of examples of work that they have done. So if you've done like a guest spot on Grey's Anatomy, spot on something, then you would make that into an actor's reel with your agency contact information in the front, and this is how you can network yourself as well, because a lot of agencies or casting directors may want an actor's reel. Those who are into voiceover have voiceover demos. You don't need a voiceover actor unless you have a voiceover demo <laughs> um, to showcase how your voice sounds on tape. Now we're into headshots. These are examples of great commercial headshots. There are two main types of headshots in the industry. There are commercial headshots and there are theatrical headshots. And I've used the term theatrical several times today. Theatrical does not mean theater. Theatrical means television film in the industry. So when you say that, make sure you What do you think are some common traits of a commercial headshot? What would you guess? just like this. How are they going to choose who they want to see when they see picture after picture after picture after picture? It's going to be what personality you portray. It's going to be in the eyes and it's going to be in the smile. So your commercial headshots have to appeal to a broad audience. Because again, the purpose of a commercial headshot is you're selling something. The actor is selling a product. So you must look friendly. You have to make the casting director want to meet you in your picture. So you have to have a great smile. Your smile has to reach, reach your eyes. Um, a, a commercial headshot can be of the head, meaning the head shot. It could be a quarter shot or a three quarter shot. Um, and you can have different poses, but most of them concentrate Here are examples of some great commercial headshots. Nice big smile, nice bright eyes. Fun energy in the face. 
face. So, you know, you have to have a lot of energy and charisma in your face. So here's an example of a head shot. Now you, you notice in a lot of these shots, this isn't like portrait photography. It's not like you're in the middle and there is a border all around you and you are perfectly in the middle of the frame. These have more art to them. Not all the time, you know, sometimes the head is cropped or sometimes it's off center. That's okay. Here's a half shot, meaning half body, three quarter shot, meaning almost the whole body. But you can just see, you still see the smile and the eyes are bright in these pictures. Eyes matter. Even little kids. more examples of great commercial headshots. What's the common theme in every, what's the first thing you see? Eyes and teeth. Eyes and teeth. There's great shots with various posing. What's the main difference you see in these shots? They're candid. No smile. They're not candid. These are these are posed. Darker color scheme. Darker color scheme. Darker color scheme. How about just the mood of them? More somber. The more somber they face, they portray a completely different mood. And they're more theatrical in nature, right? They're more dramatic. Okay? So that's what they want for a television film, because they want to know you can carry a big, meaty role. Theatrical shots are for film, television, and Broadway. They create a mood or a feeling in the picture. Most are not smiling, or they may have a little small, mysterious type of smile, not showing teeth. In a theatrical shot, the eyes tell a story. They can be close up, quarter, three quarters, or uh, three quarters of full length. Most actors have both a great commercial and a great theatrical headshot. So that way their agent can submit the headshot according to the project. <coughs> trend is to have commercial on one side and theatrical on the other and then um, always 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 this is always a rule there's never an exception to this rule your headshot is all I mean your resume is always attached to your headshot so instead of stapling it on four corners they'll just staple it on the top two so if they turn it over they can lift up the resume and see the other side of the headshot so that's that's the new trend in the industry right now so the eyes a story. 
there's something about the picture that draws you in. Body language can help set the mood. Again, eyes are not blank. Does anybody here watch American? you notice in most of these, the background is not distracting. Most of the focus is on the actor. Um, a lot of times the background is more blurred. What's the first thing you see when you look at all those pictures? Hair is not overdone. It's very simple. Your styling of clothes is important. As this young man who um, everybody was saying that the character from Harry Potter pointed out was one of the things that he noticed in both different sets of headshots. That's good. And the commercial is very bright and colorful. And the theatrical is darker. questions about headshots, because these are all things, once you graduate, this is something that you're going to have to do pretty much right away. Any questions about headshots at all? Okay. Alright, so I'm going to go over really quickly agency procedures. This is what you do when you get an agent. You want
want to call or email them once a month, preferably email, because then they can't answer that during their time, um, to keep you at the forefront of their mind for so that they you want to make sure they know who you are, so that they think of you when the projects come up at Faith and Fight Pass. But don't make, but you have to make sure you have something to say to them. So you want to tell them of any classes you are taking or any showcases you've done, or if you've gotten you've booked any work on your own or you've done a student film. Those are the types of things that you want to email them. Don't expect them to answer your email back. They'll read it, but they may be too busy to answer it back. But they, they do read it. Stop by every two to three months with a gift. The, most of them will tell you, oh, we don't want you to ever stop by and announce because um, it, it interrupts their day, they're too busy, they don't like having people stop by. However, if you bring a gift, then you may suddenly everything okay. And it doesn't have to be an expensive gift. It could be homemade cookies or muffins or, you know, find out your agent's likes and just bring a little small token. Because you want to put yourself in front of your agent for them to actually see you every two to three months. This is a big one. Hardly anybody does this. It's you just always remember and casting directors, the people who do this. Write thank yous for auditions and especially any bookings. If you get booked for a job, you want to write a thank you to your agent for Right. Thank you for the casting director for bringing you in on that audition. A great way, um, an inexpensive way, is you can print up little thank you cards at walmart.com or vistaprint.com. They're very, very cheap. Listen to all directions and follow them to a T. I think your T is an even more when they give you directions and then they, the actor thinks that they know better and does what they want. That's a great way for the agent to drop you. Don't give your agent any reason to eliminate you from their roster, because they will. If you are a problem in any way, shape, or form, they will just, they don't want to deal with you. They'll just say goodbye. Keep a pen and notepad by the phone. This is one of the number one irritating things that every agent tells me is their major pet peeve. They call you and leave a message for you to call them back, and you call them back within an hour, um, and you call them back, and you don't have a pen and paper ready to take down what they're going to tell you, and you tell them, oh, wait, hold on, let me get a pen and paper. They go ballistic because they have to make so many calls, and they have a finite time to do it. And if you are going to take their time and not even be prepared when you call them back, why do they think that you're going to be prepared for any audition you may face in the need to call back within an hour. Because remember, agents only have so many slots of people they can send to an audition. So if they're calling you, they want to send you. And if you don't call them back within an hour, guess what? They're going to cross your name off the list and go on to the next person. Because they want to make sure they get all three people to go to the audition. Because that increases their chance of their agency booking somebody and them getting paid. Okay, so you got to think of it like a business. When you go to an audition, you are the only person that goes. You do not bring your brother, your sister, your parents, your grandparents. You are the only person that goes to the audition, to the callback, and to the booking. It's not entourage. Right. This is really important for you guys. You want to keep a notebook of all your auditions. In that notebook, you want to write the date of your audition, what it was for, and what you wore. That's very important that you always know what you wore to the audition. Because if you receive a callback, you want to wear the exact same thing to the callback. Because the casting directors, the directors, whatever, they remember faces and what you wore. They don't remember names. So if you come in to your callback wearing something different, all day long they may be sitting there thinking, where's that girl with the red shirt? They wanted to see that 
to audition for. How are you going to remember what you were a month ago when auditioning? Okay. <clears throat> Always confirm with your agent if they call you and tell you that you have an audition. You have to call them back and confirm that you are going. If you confirm, you better go. And if you don't, it better be an emergency. I'm talking life and death emergency. the child to be able to go to the booking. And then the child came home from school on Friday and found out they had testing that week and couldn't go. So the mom, as after hours, calls the agency Friday evening and leaves a message on the agent's email saying that they weren't going to be at the booking. So the agent comes in Monday morning, Monday very hectic, tons of things going on. The agent doesn't have a chance to check her email before the time of the Finally, the client calls them and says, the talent's not here. And the agent's like, oh my gosh, well, you know. So she's scrambling around, calls the mom, and the mom says, oh, I called and left a message on Friday saying that you couldn't come after they had already confirmed. So then it made the agent look bad, number one, and then, then the agent had to scramble around, find a replacement, get them there, which in Atlanta is impossible within any length of so everybody that was there, the makeup artist, the photographer, the lighting technicians, everybody who was involved in the shoot had to sit and wait for the talent to come. And guess what? They get paid for that. So guess who gets the bill for all of the extra hours? The agent. So did the agent make any money on that job? No. So guess what happened to the talent? So, you have to speak to somebody if you have a cancellation. Unfortunately, because of past people in this industry, agents are cynical. They don't like problems, they don't like questions, they don't like hints of problems. So, if you are the type of person who is a needy type of person, or if you are type of person who's not on time all the time, or who will make a commitment and not follow through on a commitment, this industry is not for you. You have to be on time. You have to keep your commitments no matter what. The agent will drop you because there are, because there's always somebody right behind you who's willing to do what you're not. Okay? And that's just the reality of the business. There's a well-known fact and saying in this business that actors are among the flakiest people on the planet. Hmm. Unfortunately, it's true because a lot of actors have egos and they think the world revolves around them. That doesn't make for a very successful producer acting career if you are a smart person. 
in the waiting room for an audition, best keep to yourself. Um, I have so many examples of students who have gone on auditions and have started talking to the other actors in the room, and the actors have tried to psych them out or um, get them nervous before the audition or try to talk themselves up about all the things that they have done to make the other person more nervous and think they don't stand a chance at booking the audition. send out postcard announcements to all your contacts, all the casting directors that you've worked with in the past, um, your different agents, announce it. It's a way to publicize yourself. It's good marketing for yourself. Um, and then send thank you notes and cat to casting directors and agents so that you can get a call back. Here is an example of a postcard of one of my students who booked two commercials in the same month. Pictures on there of her on the set. This is what the back of the postcard looks like. No Charles Jones SAG. She has her website address on there. She has her LA agent and her Atlanta agent. And she sent it out to everybody she would ever work with in the industry, letting them know. Again. Yeah. But but the purpose of it is is you want you you want your and the more, the more you, you generate, the more publicity you generate about yourself, the more people are going to, you know, it's kind of like how marketing works. How do you decide when you're too annoying? I've had former students who became an annoyance with their thank you notes and their postcards. And you know, I've never actually had that problem with that. Um, because generally, You always want to make sure you know when the audition is, where the audition is. You want to know about the parking situation. That's really important because a lot of casting places are in very small facilities. They don't have a lot of parking. There may be certain parking rules that you have to follow or your car will get towed. Um, so you want to ask about the parking situation. Ask if there's any specific clothing or hair requirements for the audition. Is there a script? A lot of times the agents will forget to give you or tell you. 
you about the script. Always ask. Now ask if there are any special instructions. This doesn't have to be an hour long conversation. You can go right down the list. When, where, need parking requirements, Some pair of clothing, script, special instructions. Okay, great, goodbye. You wanna stay on the phone with you less than two minutes. A lot of LA agents talk really, really, really fast. Hey, they don't, they don't like pleasantries. They don't say, hey, how are you? It's like, hey, got an audition for you, blah, 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 blah. Hey, got a That's really how it is. Okay. So your basic audition outfit, unless otherwise told, are jeans and um, a cool fitted tee is a, is a good thing to wear. Um, or um, maybe like a, a polo and a, and a solid bright color. Um, the shirt that Lisa's wearing is good. Um, the shirt you're wearing. Chris. Chris. That's good. If you have certain camera friendly colors, those are blues, blue greens, not yellow greens, purples. You want to stay away from red on camera. You want to stay away from busy patterns on camera. Okay. This is not a good on camera trick. Okay. Unless commercial script, specifically for television commercials. That's a copy. So what is a side? It's a script for TV or film. You want to make sure you use the appropriate term for the appropriate category. What does on hold, first right of refusal, or on a veil mean? Any guesses? What? Okay, close. It means that <clears throat> with audition for something, the director or producer likes you, they don't want to book you yet want to reserve you for the day of the shoot or the days of the shoot. They haven't decided for sure they're going to use you, but they want to make sure that you don't commit yourself to something else during those dates. So they will put you on hold or they want the first right of refusal on you, meaning they can refuse you first before anybody else. They want to put you on a veil, meaning you are available for those dates for that shoot. And they may have they may be trying to decide between one or two people. They just may not be sure of the exact date they want to shoot it on. They just, there may be other logistics that they have to work out. It means you almost have the job, but you don't have it. You're on standby. You're on standby. And you can't book anything else for that date until they release you. If you agree to be on hold for they, two or three days. they pay you? No, they don't pay you. It's usually not any more than a week or two. Usually you'll know it in a couple of days. What does going to network or producer mean?
was an audition. Great if you're in New York and you are an AEA member because the rules of AEA state that if you are an equity member, you get to no matter what audition for any Broadway show, any AEA show, you automatically get an audition. ATA, it's Association of Talent Managers. That's kind of a new thing that agents have kind of split off from. Screen Actors Guild due to disagreements about some of these things. So they have formed their own association. So most agents now have gone to ATA instead of SAG. Um, so you want to make sure that your agent is either affiliated with SAG or ATA, especially in the major markets. In the regional markets, it's not as big of a deal because there's so much non-union work. What's a background or an extra? You're just kind of seeing the worst. Yeah, you're seen but not heard. Sometimes you're not even really seen. You're in the crowd people. Um, Megan Fox's first actual like date gig was an extra in Bad Boys 2. Megan Fox was actually discovered at AMTC, which is a big acting competition. I take my actors to twice a year. Okay, what's a beat?
director sends a breakdown to the agent. What is that? Oh, um, the type. Yeah. The type, yeah. yeah. What they're looking for. The breakdown of the project. What's the call time? Mm -hmm. Time you're supposed to be there. What's a call sheet? It's a, it's a list of times of the time when all the actors are supposed to be there or what happens when. What's a cold read? No, that's good. That's, I was just like, that could be. <laughs> yes, it can mean that, especially when you're preparing for a role and you want to do your history of your character. However, here, um, when somebody says, give me a list of your conflicts, that means if you're going in for, let's say, a commercial audition and you have done a Pepsi commercial before, Coke is not going to hire you because you've already been a soda pop. So they want to know all your list of conflicts, meaning all of the, the people you've done work for before, because you aren't going to get hired to do the same type of, of work. Dailies. Everything that was shot that day. Everything that was shot that day, and they took it in and they look at the dailies to see what they have. Off camera or 
more of what you see on the script, OC or OS. Right to work states. What does that mean? You don't have to be a union. Mm -hmm. You can work on any job regardless if you're union or not. With scale. Screen Actors Guild will have a scale of pay per certain job. So if you get hired to do an under five, there is a certain scale that you are going to be paid, and you cannot be paid below that scale. And then a day player, an extra, they all have scales for, for I have a question about that. Mm -hmm. Does the scale or the minimum amount that they're paid, does that change based on how many how large the production is? No. no. If it's a SAG job, it's a SAG job. Now they do have different, they do have um, low budget SAG, okay. which could be different, yes. But if it's a, if it's, um, a SAG job scale, I like the difference. Um, Lord, the different very variety of work. Can you make more than scale? Yes. Yes, if your agent negotiates that for you. But you just can't be paid under it. What's a minimum wage? Exactly. What's a stand in? Someone who looks and who's a look alike to the. For your marks when you're in the editing and stuff that people see. Or um, when they shot the first Twilight movie, a lot of the scenes Bella wasn't. So they had her standing when they shoot like scenes from the other side back and forth. Okay, good. Um, a lot of times stand-ins are also used for rehearsal time to get the and also so the star doesn't have to come out while they're setting the lights and getting the shot just right. So so do stunt people go in with that or is it two different sections? That's for, that mean? for stuntmen. Stuntmen? about earlier with the Screen Actors Guild and how they have to pay a fee if they use somebody um, who isn't in the union. And that person is Taft Hartley and they get 30 days to join the union. Trades, trade papers. Talk about this earlier. Variety Hollywood Reporter. Publications that have to do with the trade. <clears throat> What's a VO? Voiceover. Voiceover. What's a voucher?
it's mostly used in um, print nowadays, uh, but <clears throat> it states on there how long you've worked and the, um, somebody there who's in charge has to sign off on it and you take that back to your agent and that's what they submit to bill the company to get paid. Okay, auditioning. Most of the time they'll have a mark for you. You want to go to the mark. They can do that with a tape on the floor or with a spotlight or where the camera is pointing. So you always want to look for your mark. You're going to slate, which means saying your name and your agent. And then you'll perform your audition. And then when you exit a room, your exit is just as important as your entrance because it's your first and your last impression. So you're at, you need to thank everybody, um, have just as much personality and be gracious and kind and friendly when you exit as when you come in. Okay. Now, one thing I wanted to say about the slate. When you go in for an initial audition, remember I told you that most of the time it's just the casting director there and he's putting you on tape. So your, your personality and your entering your room is your first impression for the casting director. But what's your first impression to the director or the producer who's seeing the tape? It's your slate. Mm -hmm. So a lot of people don't um, put much stock in the slate. And that's a huge mistake because that is your first impression for the person who's making the decision. So your slate has to be just as good as your audition. Because if your slate isn't good, guess what they're gonna do? Fast forward, fast forward, they won't even watch your audition. Because if they say, the directors say, they can't even engage me in their slate when they're just introducing themselves who they know really well, why am I, why would they be able to handle a part? Okay? So your slate has to be fantastic. Okay. Theater versus film and acting. I know you guys have had a lot of experience. In theater acting, you may have more time to build up the emotions, whereas in film, whatever is on for that day, whatever scene, you have to be there emotionally, just like that, 80 times if necessary. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Say that again, I'm sorry. There are do overs <laughs> for film acting, but there are no do overs.
you don't get that from okay so you have to you have to create your own motivation in film and not rely on the clients and sometimes in film acting the person that is playing against you for a scene isn't necessarily there like they're filming just you and someone else is reading the line and they film those lines later so exactly you may have to do a lot of acting on your own um, acting like you're getting a reaction from somebody else who's not even there. Or you may be acting against a blue screen or a green screen of some monster that's not even there, right? Um, what else? to project to the very last person in the last row, the last seat of the auditorium. Um, that person has to feel all the emotions just like the person in the front row. So your acting has to be big, over the top, big facial expressions, lots of movement, okay? On film, your acting is very small. You know how I said earlier that the camera sees everything and the camera can see when you are thinking? So you don't even have to say a word.
do you have any questions, first of all, about anything that I've gone over today that maybe you don't know before we get into the actual? I'm going to watch some of your, your pieces, and um, we're going to do some fun little things where I'm going to take your theater pieces and I'm going to film. Oh, What time is it anyway? On the workshop <coughs> side of it, if you wear both glasses and contacts, do, you, do they prefer one or the other? Or? What I would do is take some shots with your glasses and some without, and then let your, if you have an agent, let the agent decide. Um, and they may want to use some shots with and some without. Facial hair, most of the time, they don't want it, but you can always go in with a little bit and then shave it off at the shoot. Yes. What auditioning for the different pieces as far as it goes with commercials who the managers are in, in your area and for the bigger markets there are more managers than the smaller markets um, of course there's not a whole lot of managers that work with smaller markets because it's just not lucrative enough for them but um, you, you, you would submit to them the same way that you would an agent um, and, the, and really the best place to get in front of people like that is to do showcases that's really, anytime that you can find of doing a showcase, it's, it's kind of like what I call a shortcut. It gets you in front of several people at one time who can make a difference in your career. So anytime you come across an opportunity like that, you just have to do your research on the showcase and make sure it's legitimate and that the people who are there are really who they say they are. Yes? Okay, um, this question. For example, if I'm interested in theater acting, New York is the best place to go, but would it be wiser to start out on a smaller market? Because they tell us in television to start out, for example, newsmaking on a smaller market and work our way up. Therefore, you mess up in the theater is not the, the same yeah. as communications yeah. because in all the smaller markets, they still have to have news shows and they still have to have TV stations. It's not the same way in theater. Mm -hmm. You could go to a smaller market and do community theater for free you want to all day long. <laughs> um, but it's really not going to help you or matter as much. You've really got to go. If you're going to wanting to be in theater, you've got to go to New York. She just turned 13, and my stepmother doesn't want her to be influenced by me. I graduate in the spring of 68, and I immediately get my draft notice. I move to Boston. Because in the Midwest, you can get five years for draft evasion. In Massachusetts, You guys know why you want to stay in character until the director says come? Because <coughs> you're still on film, but why, why does that make any difference? Because what if they want to do a cutaway with you when you're editing of, of just a, a, a soft and If you walked into a 
room and you had just gotten into a car accident, you're going to be acting and, and walking and, and conveying and speaking entirely different than if you had just won a million dollars in the lottery. Right? That's a clear cut choice that gives you clear cut directions as an actor how you are going to start out your mom. So you as an actor have to be very specific about why you're saying what you're saying, why you're talking about the people you're talking about in your monologue, so that you can be real, so that it can be believable to us up here watching. Otherwise, you're just up there saying that. Okay, so think about that. Think about when you are talking to your fiance, think about, have it actually run through your mind. Okay, oh great, here comes this part. No, no, here's what's really going to sound bad to her. Is she going to still want me? Is she going to break up with me? Is, am I going to still have my fiancé after I, I divulge this? Does she really love me that much? All of those things should be going through your head if you are living in the moment as if you were telling it to her for the first time for real. Does that make sense? Yes. Okay, so let's try it one more time. And action. A week after the neighbor shipped off to Vietnam. While he's there, my stepmother kicks me out of the house. You see, the FBI began asking the neighbors about me. And besides, her daughter, my stepsister, she just turned 13 and my stepmother didn't want her to be influenced by me. I graduate in the spring of 68 and I immediately get my draft notice. I moved to Boston. Because in the Midwest, you can get five years for draft evasion. In Massachusetts, only two. talking to somebody and it will help you connect with that person more the last couple of lines when you're talking about and then I get my draft notice in 1968 in the summer or spring in 1968 after you say the FBI starts asking questions about me then say then I got my draft notice and so now I have to move to I want to move to Massachusetts the wording of it so that you're actually talking to somebody and it makes sense that you're having a conversation <coughs> and, and you're explaining why you want her to move to Massachusetts instead of it being a storytelling form because this monologue is more of a storytelling form for film it works better if it's not storytelling it's in first person and you, you're, you're actually talking to somebody and trying to convince them of something 